This is a friendly parabola. The question is, can you approximate that parabola using only linear functions? So using a combination of basis functions one and x and do that approximation in the least squared sense in the interval from one to two. So pause the video and think how you would uh, tackle this. Obviously, we need to minimize the difference between the approximation and the function itself. So we need to construct some sort of uh, functional, some sort of energy difference. So that functional will depend on our approximation, f tilde of x. And we're going to say that this is the energy, the difference in the interval from minus to two of the difference between our function and our approximation f and f prime and since we're working in the least square sense we're going to square that difference so this functional should be minimized now you might wonder why do we really take a square here wouldn't also an absolute value work for example or any other power of, uh, of that difference uh, that's true but the nice thing about the square here is that it gives easy formulas to work with so this is a conventional choice the minimization in the least squared sense Okay, so the idea is to construct the best approximation uh, f tilde such that this function here, this uh, difference between the function and its approximation is minimized. Now the way we're going to do that is we're going to write down our approximation as a sum of basis functions with unknown expansion coefficients. So the first unknown coefficient u1 uh, multiplies the basis function b1 of x and in our case b1 of x is just a constant and then we have a second uh, unknown coefficient u2 multiplying a second basis function which is known and which is just x so the goal is to figure out what what u1 and u2 are now that we know how we're going to approximate our uh, f tilde here, uh, approximate f using f tilde rather, we can substitute that back into our expression for j. So j is actually going to be an integral from 1 to 2 of the square difference of f. And then we have minus u1 b1 of x minus u2 b2 of x squared dx. So we can actually expand this a little bit. So that's going to be the integral uh, from 1 to 2, which I'm too lazy to write. And then we have f squared times dx, which I'm also too lazy to write. And then we have the integral u1 squared b1 squared, integral u2 squared b2 squared, dx integrating minus, minus one, 1 to, to 2 and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so these were the squares. Then we have the double products. So we have minus 2, the integral of f u1 b1, minus 2, the integral f u2 b2, and then minus times minus is plus. So we have plus 2, the integral u1 u2 b1 b2. So because of my laziness, I haven't really explicitly written down, for example, that b1 and b2 depend on x, but it's very important to realize that just u1 and u2 are plain and boring constants, and b1 and b2 depend on x, and they play, of course, a big role in the integration uh, over x. So now we know what our functional looks like. The next question is trying to figure out how you can make sure that this thing is minimized uh, in a way that will allow you to calculate the unknown coefficients u1 and u2. So pause the video to think about this. What we're going to do obviously is putting our partial derivative of j with respect to our coefficients equal to zero. So the partial derivative of j with respect to u1 should be equal to zero. And we do something similar for the partial derivative with respect to u2. And that hopefully will give us a system of two equations and two unknowns that we can happily solve. Okay, let's uh, go ahead here. So 
reminder of the fact that u1 and u2 are constants do not depend on x so we can move them outside of the integral over x um, first term does not depend on u1 for the second term we have u1 squared so if we take the derivative that becomes 2u1 and then we still have the integral b1 squared um, this thing does not depend on u1 only on u2 so we move on to the next line we have then minus 2 the integral f b1 uh, for the purposes of the derivative of course if the derivative of u1 with respect to u1 that's just 1 and this thing only depends on u2 and then finally we have plus 2 and then the integral u2 b1 b2 equal to 0. Since this is equal to 0 let's forget about these factors too. And let's now do something similar for the partial derivative of j with respect to our second unknown coefficient u2. So that's just changing uh, ones and twos basically. So exactly the same thing going on here. f b2 plus 2 u1 b1 b2. So now we have our two equations and our two unknowns. Um, in order to bring out a structure, it's very instructive to write this as a matrix problem. So we have a certain matrix of coefficients times our unknown uh, u1 and u2 that we want to calculate is equal to some right-hand side. So let's see what's going on for the first equation. For the first equation, the coefficient of u1, we see that over here. That's the integral from 1 to 2 of b1 times b1 dx. Now, as a shorthand, I'm just going to write that as a scalar product of b1 with itself, with the scalar product of two functions being defined as multiplying these two functions and integrating it over x over the interval uh, 1 to 2. Good. So that's the coefficient of u1. For the coefficient of u2, you see it up there. That's also a scalar product, but this time b1 and b2. And then for the right-hand side, so the minus becomes a plus if we move it to the other side. Uh, so there we have the scalar product of f and b1. And then we do something similar for the second equation. So the coefficient of u1, you see that over here. That's b1 b2 and the coefficient of u2 is over there that's b2 times b2 and then the right hand side is f of b2 and that clearly brings out the structure it brings out uh, the way you can calculate all of these elements as, as scalar products and it also allows you to easily extend that and to more basis functions uh, if you want so in theory, in a general case, we have solved this problem. What we now need to do is just plug in, for our particular case, what the value of f is, what the value of b1 and b2 is, calculate all of these scalar products, and then finally calculate u1 and u2. So that's not a difficult calculation, but it's slightly painful, uh, let's say. So pause the video, roll up your sleeves, and do the calculation. Okay, let's roll up my sleeves now. We have, first of all, the scalar product b1, b2. So that's going to be the integral from 1 to 2. So let's start with b1, b1. b1, b1, so that's 1 times 1 dx. So that's uh, that is basically just, just 1. Okay, next up we have b1 with b2. So b1, b2, the integral from 1 to 2, 1 x dx so that's x squared over 2 evaluated between 2 and 1 so this is 2 minus 1 half this is 3 over 2 so far so good b1 b2 is 1 2 and then we have x times x so that's uh, x squared giving us x cubed over 3 between 2 and 1 so that's 
8 over 3 um, minus 1 over 3. And that's 7 over 3. Good. We have the matrix done. So now we have these guys to worry about. So we have f of uh, f with b1. So that's 1 to 2. Um, so this is where it becomes a little bit more painful. So our f was 10x minus 1 squared minus 1. And our b1 luckily is just 1. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, in our mind, make a small substitution here. X prime is X minus one. And then this thing becomes 10 times. Uh, so this is a squared after integration. This becomes X prime to the power of three divided by three. And then for the bounds, we need to decrease them by one here. So this is between one and zero. And then finally, we have again the integral from 1 to 2 of uh, dx uh, with a minus sign. So this is uh, minus 1. And if we do that, we have 10 over 3 minus 1, aka 3 over 3. So 10 minus 3 is so again 7 over 3. Okay, almost there. Let's keep going. We have fb2. So now we have the same thing here, but we should replace uh, the, the 1 by an x. Um, let's do that by just expanding the whole thing here. So we have an integral from 1 to 2. And then we have 10x squared times x. So this becomes 10x cubed. With the double product, it's minus 20. So minus 20, and then with the extra x, it's minus 20x squared. And then we have 10 minus 1 is 9 times the extra x. So we have plus 9x dx. So this becomes 10. And then uh, we have then to the fourth uh, divided by 4. So this becomes uh, 16 over 4 minus 1 over 4 for the first guy and then for the second we have minus 20 and then we have the third power divided by 3 so this becomes 8 over 3 minus 1 over 3 and then we have 9 times the squared divided by 2 so we have 2 squared is 4 divided by 2 and then we have minus 1 over 2 okay and it's immediately obvious that this is 13 over 3. Good. Uh, right. Um, so now we have all of these coefficients. Let's write down our matrix. So our matrix becomes, uh, so we have 1, 3 over 2, 3 over 2, and then 7 over 3. Our unknown coefficients u1, u2, and then our right-hand side, um that's 7 over 3 13 over 3 yeah, you can clean this up multiply everything by 6 if you want so that we have 6 9 9 14 u1 u2 and then for the right hand side it's 14 26 okay and also here it immediately is obvious that this uh, then gives us that u1 u2 is equal to 1 over 3 and then we have minus 38 30. okay so again not difficult but just slightly elaborate and the final conclusion is that our approximation is and then uh, so we have for our b1 that's minus 38 over 3 um, times b1 which is just 1 and then for our second expansion coefficient we have 30 over 3 that's 10 second basis function was x so here we have it our linear approximation to our parabola in the interval from 1 to 2